Good evening. I'm Alan Holman. I'm the curator of the Hampton History Museum. Welcome to our Port Hampton Lecture Series. Uh, tonight we have Tim Receiver, who is currently the Director of Programs at the Peace Tech Lab in Washington, D.C., an organization that works to reduce violent conflict using technology to accelerate and scale peace-building efforts. From 2000 to 2013, Tim worked as a Foreign Affairs Officer at the U.S. Department of State with a focus on applied technology, and he also served active duty in the United States Air Force for nine years as a meteorologist. Tim moved here with us uh, to Phoebus in 2018 and has put together three books on the history of the community. He also manages the daily blog Phoebus and Fort Monroe, Then and Now, which chronicles the stories and photos from uh, these communities. And you can find more information at Facebook, uh, facebook.com Phoebus History, or at the uh, www.phoebusmemories.org. Uh, tonight, Tim's going to talk to us about uh, the contents of his latest Phoebus book, uh, Little Chicago. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Tim here momentarily, but I do want you to think about uh, what he's saying. And uh, as you arrive at questions, which we hope will prompt in you, uh, comment in the, uh, in the comment section on, on Facebook Live. And we'll collect those, and we'll save some time, Tim, at the very end, maybe 15 minutes after the uh, presentation is done, and uh, we'll ask Tim those questions. I'll ask him, and uh, he'll answer for you. If we don't get to your question tonight, Tim will go on to Facebook and, uh, and uh, give you an answer in the next couple of days. So uh, one other small announcement is on the 17th, St. Patrick's Day, we're going to have a Poison Dwarf here uh, performing virtually. Uh, they will be here. To you, they'll be virtual. Uh, so tune in with us on the, on the 17th at 7 o'clock and Poison Dwarf. So, Tim, I'm going to get out of your way and let you uh, carry on. All right. Well, th thank you very much, Alan, and, uh, and to Seamus and the Hampton History Museum for having me. It's a real honor to be here with you tonight. i um, also like to thank my wife, April, who's here, and... Um, Laura Sanford, Martha Morris, and uh, Tom Jackson for, for helping with the content of the, the latest book, Little Chicago, which is a, um, a photo history through the years of, of Phoebus, Virginia. So over the holidays, I, I read a book. Um, I, I just got it for, it's the Chris Craft uh, autobiography flight that he wrote um, in, his, in his late 80s. And I was just getting it to see a little bit about his life at NASA and you know some of the just some of the stories that came out of that and what I noticed from the very beginning is chapter one is all about Phoebus and how it really shaped his life his, his dedication his hard work his entrepreneurship his creativity and kind of all those lessons that he learned growing up in Phoebus and he grew up in a, a very different place than today so he grew up in Prohibition, Virginia, in Phoebus with, with um, dozens of saloons all around. So he grew up in his grandmother's saloon and she was trying to make ends meet, trying to be very entrepreneurial and, and trying new things. And I think a lot of what he saw growing up in Phoebus in that environment really kind of shaped his life and shaped his work at NASA and his work to put mission control together. And this is... Uh, this is a photo here of, of Clara Albright's saloon in the middle, his grandmother. And she, uh, she owned the saloon. She bought the saloon next to it, Cognos. And he spent a lot of his early years just playing in these, these huge empty saloons uh, once Prohibition was here. And we, I'm, my wife and I moved here back in, in uh, August of 2018. And we moved into an old Victorian. And the person that put that together was uh, P.A. Fuller. So you might know him better from the Trusty House or Fuller's, uh, but he, he was a, a contractor and a builder. And you know I was looking at the history of, of Fuller, and the more that I dug into his history and to the history of our street, into the Mellon Street, Mallory Street, uh, I was pretty fascinated with that, and started up uh, Phoebus and Fort Monroe then and now, a daily blog of photos uh, from the two communities. And I've been cataloging all that on phoebusmemories.org, which is another site where we uh, keep all these, these photos together. And, you know, through all this research, I, you know, what I found, and it shouldn't surprise a lot of people that live in Phoebus, but Phoebus has a wild side. Uh, I know you're shocked. Um, how wild was it? Well, th this is an advertisement from 
uh, cockfight series that was taking place in, in Phoebus in, in 1898. And P.A. Fuller was leading the cockfights and had advertised this in as far away as New York City and Baltimore. People were coming here for these, these fights in the Roseland Club Hotel. And some of the bets on this were, you know, the bets were $500, which today is about $16,000 a hand. And in all uh, total, $5,000 changed hands in 1898. And that's the equivalent of about $160,000. So that's pretty crazy for a morning in Phoebus in 1898. You know, what else was crazy? Saloons running 24 seven, uh, 80 saloons estimated in 1898. Uh, it went down a little bit in, in turn of the century, but a, a lot of saloons for sure. Um, th this is a, a story from 1898, and they say that Phoebus was the, had 80 saloons and was the toughest town within 100 miles. And they said with that many saloons for that many people, you can imagine what kind of town it is. It, it was also wild to the tune of 300 soldiers fighting in the streets um, on a day, in, in, also in 1898. Um, wild like Babyface Nelson hiding out from the FBI. Um, but it's also obviously a very tight-knit community and people taking care of each other and a lot of the stories that I've seen over the, the decades and the centuries is the, you know, the people that are making money in the community are putting that money back into the community and strengthening it. So for today, you know, these are, these are different eras that I, I kind of hope to get through. I don't know if we'll have time to get through it all, you know, but looking at the, the history of Phoebus, obviously it goes back way before the Civil War. Uh, the Kikatan were here, there were 200 villages when the English arrived in 1607. The Spanish were here decades before that. Um, you know, when we're looking at Phoebus, it has a lot of firsts. So it was the first camp of the Union on southern soil during the Civil War. It was the first community for freed slaves in the United States, uh, just barely eclipsing Hampton's own community. Um, and it was also the the site of some of the earliest elected officials in the state of Virginia uh, in 1901 when we held the first elections. And this is pretty substantial considering the community itself is only one mile by one mile. So there's a lot going on there for just that. So we're gonna talk about the Civil War, the railroad, the Spanish-American War, uh, the incorporation uh, of the town in 1900, the march toward prohibition to go from 80 saloons to zero, the bootleggers and the scandals, um, the, the corruption that was going on in the community, uh, in the mayor's office and the police uh, enabling bootleggers, and the Great Depression, World War II, and then a little bit on the consolidation with Hampton and the HRBT and some of the effects in Phoebus. So looking at the map, just to kind of get everybody uh, their bearing straight, you know, there's Phoebus, you can see Mill Creek, Fort Monroe is, is there, like right across the bridge. Uh, the thing that, um, you should be aware of is, is Roseland Manor is, uh, sorry, Roseland Farm. Uh, before the Civil War, this was a, a huge area, almost all of Phoebus, that was owned by Joseph Seeger. He was a union sympathizer and was representing Virginia in the U.S. Congress during the Civil War for Virginia. So the um, South Carolina uh, Fort Sumter happens, it falls. And so that happens in April of 1861. And a few days later, Lincoln is he's petrified about that. He sends in reinforcements to Fort Monroe. So he sends in about uh, 4,000 soldiers to Fort Monroe. And Fort Monroe is not the place it was, or that it is today. It, there's been a lot of fill over the years, so it doesn't have a lot of land for all these, these soldiers that are coming in. And even more so, it doesn't have water for all these soldiers. They bring food but water is a huge issue. And so Joseph Seeger, who owns all the property in Phoebus, uh, you know, what will become Phoebus, he offers that to Fort Monroe to be able to station their troops there. So they come across the bridge and they, they set up camp in 1861. And you know, just, just to give you some background, Fort Monroe has always had a really tight connection with Phoebus. And it was built from 1819 to 1834 and 
Robert E. Lee was the, one of the engineers on the ending of uh, when they were finishing up the project. So Robert E. Lee was obviously part of the Confederacy. He knew the strengths of Fort Monroe at that time. And you know, in addition to water, in addition to space, one thing that, that they were looking to do is there was a huge building uh, between where the VA is now and Hampton University. And there was a building there called the, the Chesapeake Female Seminary. And what they were also worried about is sniper positions in that cupola. So they took that over as soon as they got into the Phoebus area and they, they made that a hospital for soldiers. And during the Civil War, it treated Union and Confederate soldiers. It was also the beginnings of uh, training or uh, teaching um, freed slaves once they came across um, to Camp Hamilton. And that was before even Emancipation Oak. So that was where they were in 1861 into 1862. And then they relocated to um, the Emancipation Oak in that area. And these are just some photos from, this is the, the camp for uh, Camp Hamilton, some of the tents that were there. And there was one distinct unit that was there that, that really over the years has, has gained a lot, of, a lot more of attention, but they were obviously uh, got a lot of attention at the time too. But that was the 5th New York, uh, which were called the Zouaves. And they were, they were a New York unit that was influenced. They, they had an influence from an Algerian battalion of the French army. So they had vest and baggy pants and fez hats and they were uh, really noteworthy for their bravery and they played a major role during the Battle of Big Bethel, which was the first open battle, open conflict between uh, the Union and the Confederates during the Civil War. And this is a photo, this is the east side of the, the Hampton River, um, Hampton Bridge that was, this was demolished in May of 1861 so they demolished the bridge. You can see buildings in Hampton on the other side of that bridge, and they would be gone just a few months later. So in August, uh, the Confederates would, would burn their own town, and all those buildings would be lost. And some people, they, you're probably aware of this, but the contraband decision, General Butler at Fort Monroe, there were escaped slaves that showed up at Fort Monroe, and he considered them contraband of war. And, and declared that any, any slave that escaped to Union lines would be free. And so overnight there were hundreds and thousands of, of slaves escaping to Fort Monroe, and they were coming into Phoebus, into the Phoebus area, uh, at the time was called Mill Creek, and they established what was called the Mill Creek or Slab Town in 1864. Uh, this, well, this was in 1864, they established it in 1861. Uh, but there's also a Slab Town in Hampton that was just a few weeks um, newer than this one. And when we look at kind of a, a lot of things were coming together to propel Phoebus after the Civil War. So this is the, this is the same building you saw before. This is the Chesapeake Female Seminary, the Chesapeake Hospital during the Civil War that treated the soldiers. This would become the headquarters for what was called the, the Old Soldier's Home or uh, Longer wording of it was the southern branch of the, oh, sorry, southern branch of the National Home of the Disabled Soldiers. So it's, it doesn't roll off the tongue, it's hard to remember. But this was the facility, the VA facility uh, at the time for soldiers in the South. And it was also the first integrated federal facility for white and black soldiers. Uh, and when I say that, it wasn't integrated black and white like you would think of today, but it was they were treating black soldiers and white soldiers, which was the first for, for this. And this Chesapeake Hospital would be central to the area for, for decades until it was torn down, I think, in around 1908, 1909. And this was one of the main buildings built around the turn of the century and the main hospital later on. And this is the, the hotel at the old soldier's home. So there's a lot, of, a lot of Victorian elements that are going on here and, and really kind of an amazing place at the time. And this is the Phoebus Gate that was uh, the bridge between the old soldier's home and Phoebus. 
And this would also be the place where a lot of people came to spend their paydays on booze and Phoebus over the years. Um, it would be shut down from time to time when things got really bad, but this was what the bridge looked like. And there's a, a veteran there on the right side. So at, at the same time, you've got, you know, you've got this, this um, facility at the top, the old soldier's home that's opening up and hundreds of soldiers pouring in there and their money. You've got Fort Monroe going on at the same time. Joseph Seeger, who gave up all of his land to the Union, uh, doesn't get his money back. He petitions the government for funding to pay for his, his land and all the damage they've caused to it. He never gets that. He is really going broke, and he sell, the, the courts sell off his land. So they take his land, they divide it up, and they make this property in 1871. They make this into Chesapeake City, so rebranding it, building new lots. And it's right between Fort Monroe and right between the old soldier's home. And obviously, a lot of paychecks in between um, that go into the, the, the drinking. Um, at the same time, I mean, I say that a lot. At the same time, there's a lot of things going on after the Civil War. Um, but one of those is, is Harrison Phoebus. So there, there is a Hygieia Hotel that's set up before the Civil War. Um, close to uh, the same side of, as uh, the Dead Rise at Fort Monroe. So it's a little bit further in than that, but that's where the, the hotel was. Edgar Allan Poe recited The Raven there for the first time. And during the Civil War, it's demolished. So after the Civil War, they're building um, a re replacement for that. So there's a need for tourism. There's a need for a hotel. Uh, Samuel Shoemaker is part of the Adams Express Company, the vice president. And he's, he takes a liking to Harrison Phoebus. He buys the, the Hygieia in about the same time in, in 1871, 1872. And he hands that over to Harrison Phoebus to run it because he sees Harrison Phoebus comes to the area. He's doing a lot of things. He's um, running the post office. He's the notary. He's shipping things for Adams Express. And, and it's got a lot of activities, but a lot of energy as well. So Samuel Shoemaker turns it over to, to Harrison Phoebus to run this new Hygieia Hotel. And this is down close to where the, ba uh, the, the uh, bandstand is today. Um, Aaron Firth, if you're watching us, I know it's not called the bandstand title, but it's down on that part of the park at Fort Monroe um, where that bandstand is today. But it goes for an entire block, and it just gets bigger and bigger, and Harrison Phoebus is going around the country seeing what he can add to this hotel to make it better and he's adding bass and elevators and electricity and you know not maybe not electricity but he's adding steam and lights and all these kind of new amenities that are that are just seen in new york or you know places that aren't you know that are kind of cutting edge and so that hotel keeps getting bigger and bigger and what he does is he he calls um collis p huntington who is the head of the cno railroad the CNO Railroad moves into um, Newport News to the shipyards, and Harrison Phoebus is saying, you know, like if I can get that railroad down to, you know, the Fort Monroe to the hotels, like that business would really be ramped up in a huge way, and we could expand that out. And so Collis P. Huntington agrees to to bring the railroads down to the hotels, and he. He builds to Chesapeake City, which is you know current Phoebus, builds that in 1882. And the community is so happy, the Chesapeake community is so happy that they rename the train station Phoebus and they rename the, the post office Phoebus after Harrison Phoebus. And it would be another eight years before that, that train gets all the way down to the hotels how he had envisioned. And Harrison Phoebus had died before then. He died in 1886 at the age of 45 of a, of a massive heart attack. And this is Roseland Manor. This is his, his property that he built um, right before he died. He didn't get to see this. He didn't get to live in it, but his family did. And they, they lived there for about 20 years before they moved. And there, you know, there are a lot of other things that come together at the same time. Um, one of those is, you know, the, the military is here, obviously, and all those paychecks. Uh, rebuilding after the, the Civil War is, is in full steam. The refrigeration is something brand new. And obviously, seafood to this area is, is massive. So, 
you know, this is a, a shot from Newcomb's um, wharfs at Mill Creek in the 1930s, but even before that in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, you have a lot of people that are responsible for not only the growth in Phoebus, but in, in Hampton and the region. Uh, one of those is John Mallory Phillips. Uh, it's hard to tell with this photo, but he's African American. He was really uh, had an oyster empire in, in Hampton and he started running what was called the People's Building and Loan Association. So this gave out loans for houses in the area to African Americans who couldn't get loans from regular banks. Uh, he financed hundreds of homes in the area, and he also financed Bayshore, which was the, the resort at Buck Row um, for African Americans that, that lasted all the way from the 1890s all the way up until you know, when it was demolished. Um, this is John McKinneman. He was, um, ran uh, all the crabs in, in Hampton. Uh, really, if you, if you look at, there's still, his tens are all around Hampton still to this day. But he was from Boston, came here, and started a, a new process for canning crabs in the area. And probably the most influential, these were all huge giants in, in Hampton, but J.S. Darling uh, was, was another one that, if you ever saw the, the oyster piles in Hampton, he was responsible for those oyster piles and putting Hampton on the map. So the thing that he also did was um, reinvested, like I said, reinvested the money. A lot of, all these men reinvested the money back into the communities. Uh, J.S. Darling reinvested in things like streetcars. So he connected up the, the Newport News shipyard and you know, tourists going to Buck Row and Old Point Comfort and the Hampton Institute and all these things. He kind of linked them all together uh, with these networks, with his, his own money. And obviously he made a lot of money on that, but that's, you know, just the vision that, that he had to put that together. And then as we, you know, we look at going back to Phoebus, you know, all these things at the same time, we also have reconstruction going on. So, you know, look at Phoebus as kind of the, you're right next to the Union in the South, you know, after the Civil War. And this was the way that the Union kind of envisioned. This is how, you know, Abraham Lincoln, I would think, would, would envision Reconstruction afterwards, uh, the diversity and the, the ownership and the entrepreneurship that was going on. And this is pretty obvious when you look at the, the saloons at the air, in the time so there, there were more than 42 saloons. There were 42 official ones in the directory. But just looking at that, there were 14 women owners of saloons. I mean, there, there were a lot more women owning restaurants, obviously, at the time. But um, 14 women out of the 42 owned the saloons. Six African-American owners of saloons. Even three African-American women were saloon owners, which is, is pretty incredible. And this is just one page. There's you know, another page of this. And kind of going through it, um, you know, at the time there were breweries here, there were distilleries here. Um, this is Joseph Daly. He became the treasurer of Phoebus in the early 1900s, but he started with National Brewing Company, and this is his run on Curry Street in 1890. So National Brewing was, was ha they had a brewery here, just to show you how big, you know, they, they weren't just importing beer, they were making the beer here. And that, they were making the Colt 45 and the Natty Bow and all the things that you would, you would know, but they were making all that in Phoebus um, at the time. And then the other thing that made it real easy was they, the putting the brewing companies here. This was home brewing. They were out of Richmond, but this was, this was the, the, the brewery that was located in Phoebus, and it was located next to the C&O Railroad. So when they were making this, they could, they could put it on the rail cars. They could send it out. They could put it on the... The, the streetcar, they could put it on whatever they wanted and get it to the, the Old Point Comfort. They can get it out to New York. They can get it out to uh, Baltimore, to Philly. And the same with the seafood, like all this was within a day's trip of, of, um, with a ship. And these are just some of the, the saloons that were around at the time. This is the Phoebus Club on Mallory Street. This is one of the early um, saloons. Some of these buildings are still around. This one I know people will probably, re probably remember. This is uh, Fuller's from 1901. So this is the one P.A. Fuller built. Uh, I'm guessing he built it with his cockfighting money, but he also had another huge business building houses around the area. So it's, it's hard to tell. But um, this was around until, I am guess uh, I should know this, 1993, I think, is when it was demolished. Uh, this, is, this is the... Um, 
um, Clark's Palace. And this was um, close to where the gas station is today, across from the McDonald's. Um, this is where that was located. And it was here, I think, up until the 1960s. And I showed you the Rosen Club where the, um, in the beginning there was a side view, but this is Rosen Club Hotel. Uh, this is where the post office would be today. So looking down, looking down towards Willard Avenue. And one of the most, if Ann Dupes watching, this is the, one of the more interesting people in, in Phoebus history, um, Carrie Monroe. This was uh, Carrie Monroe Terry. She was, she was married to a Mr. Terry. Uh, got divorced, he was a cad, she said. Um, but she was running a saloon called the, the Terry's Place. So I'd been looking for this for about a year and came across this during uh, quarantine. But this is a view of her, ho her, sorry, her saloon. And if you go back, um, the, the building on the left is uh, Sly Clyde's today. So that was her house. She ran a florist next to it. Uh, the Smith family would buy this just a few years later in about 1913, and there was a florist there for some time, and the building is still there today. The, not only the slack lines, but there's a florist next to it. And probably the, the, the most documented um, photos of saloons in, in Phoebus history would be the, the Richelieu. So this is 2 East Mellon Street, um, Lancers, Fert, uh, Fertittas, like that was all there. And it really was kind of the Old West meets the East Coast. So looking at this, like you can see the swinging saloon doors there. It, like you wouldn't know this was Virginia at the time. It looks more like Arizona or you know, somewhere out West. And this is another photo of, of the time. And you can see the old soldiers out to the side there, all the old Civil War soldiers. And some of that glass is still there today, actually. And this is an inside view of the Richelieu. This is the Palace Hotel. This is the Chesapeake Hotel. This is the Atlantic Garden Hotel and Restaurant. And some of these bottles still survive from his, his saloons that went into about 1910, 1911. Uh, but, but um, if you want more from the Phoebus photos of the, the saloons, if you go to phoebusmemories.org slash saloons, there's a, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the link. I'll, I'll put it on the, the viewing afterwards, but there's a, there's a list of all the saloons there and all the photos that I have from all the saloons. And I came across this a few weeks ago. This is from the arena, and it was on the corner of Mellon and Mallory Street, and they're advertising... Uh, which is crazy, a free hot lunch three hours a day. So any day of the week you can go in and get a free hot lunch from 11 to 2, and it just makes you wonder like how much money they were making to be able to give everybody free lunch every day. And if we look at also the, you know, another issue, on the back side of Mellon Street there was a red light district, so houses of ill fame and ill repute. Um, down the back of Mellon Street, you know, that was a, a, definitely a thing. And looking at, you know, this was a write-up um, about 1899, but it says, although there were about 1,000 inhabitants, there were 63 saloons running in full blast, besides gambling, hell holes, and brothels without number. So there was, anyway, a lot, a lot going on in, in Phoebus at that time. And all that culminates in about 1898. So the Spanish-American War happens. And all the things that make Phoebus grow like it does, uh, the railroad and the water access and all these things come together to make it a perfect place to deploy soldiers and sailors for the Spanish-American War. So everybody is coming down the C&O Railroad, they're taking shore leave in Phoebus, and you know, that is, um, really leads to the growth even more of the saloons in Phoebus in 1898 into 1899. And in addition, this is, this is a new thing, and obviously I'm not, I'm discovering these things, but they're probably not new to some of you, but there, is a, there was a Civil War, sorry, a Spanish-American War hospital in Phoebus, down close to where the 7-Eleven is on the way to Buck Row. So there was a huge hospital down there called the Josiah Simpson Hospital, and it was treating hundreds of soldiers that were there, um, you know, getting 
shore leave and, and getting uh, recouping after the Spanish-American War. And it was there from 1898 to 1899. And this is just a f another photo that, that I surfaced from that. So, you know, the, the, one of the, for the first book that I put together on the, the history of Phoebus, I'd, I'd heard about riots in Phoebus, and so there are um, people kind of conflate all of these riots together, that there was one big riot, but there were a series of riots through 1898 that were really crazy, and each one was really distinct. Um, and I covered this in one of the talks that I did here, but in um, 1898, June 14th and 15th, there was um, a unit called the 1st Maryland Volunteer Regiment, and it turns out that most people at Fort Monroe didn't like them very much. The regulars didn't like them. Uh, they were very unprofessional and, and not trained very well. And so this first Maryland Volunteer Regiment got in a lot of fights in, in the community. They started bar fights in, in Phoebus. And one night they started a fight that ended up in 300 soldiers fighting in the street all night long into the morning uh, with about 75 people being arrested and taking to Fort Monroe. Um, that would subside for a, a few more weeks. In August 22nd and 23rd, a uh, saloon owner uh, sh turned off the alcohol to one of the Marines that was there. And uh, when the Marine wouldn't take no for an answer, was, was shot in the leg and held all the, the, res or the, um, the soldiers at bay with a, with a shotgun until the police arrived to take him into custody. This led to a riot all night long into the next day. Um, there is a lot more around that one because the soldiers came back and some of them were arrested. Um, the unit came back with their friends and they tried to ransack the jail and break their, their comrades out of jail. And the Phoebus police had, had um, deputized several uh, African Americans and, and members of the Phoebus fire department to stand guard at the jail. They had opened fire on some of these soldiers and shot them in the leg, didn't kill anybody. Um, but it became a, a kind of a, a national story uh, that came out of Phoebus and, and definitely worth reading about. And then finally, on October 17th, 18th, there was another shooting in a, in a saloon called the Rialto. Um, it's, I'll just say that the Rialto saloon burns to the ground that night and the, the, sailor, the soldiers and sailors are cutting the lines to the, the um, um, fire department apparatus that they bring out there to try to put out this fire. And then the next year, you know, th things can't get worse, but they do. Uh, the the um, yellow fever takes hold at the soldier's home and spreads out to Phoebus. So yellow fever breaks out. Phoebus, there's a, a, f a few cases in Phoebus. And a lot of the citizens of Phoebus have recollections of what happened in Norfolk a few decades before when thousands of people had died from yellow fever. So there are people trying to get out. There's a shotgun quarantine that goes around Phoebus and it's, um, it's really incredible. And when I gave this talk the first time, I was saying you can't imagine what it would be like to be quarantined and kind of shut into your homes and locked into a community. Anyway, I, you all can imagine now. It's, it's not too hard to envision anymore. So the community after 1899, they come together and they decide to rebrand the community <laughs> for property values probably and, and trying to just get more, um, you know, the Spanish-American War had passed and they're trying to build their community and they have a horrible reputation out of all this. And so the community, everybody was calling it Phoebus. It had, well, wasn't officially Phoebus, but they rebrand the whole town Phoebus and get rid of Chesapeake City altogether and they incorporate with the state, and there's a new count, town council and a huge parade, and the, even the governor comes in, um, James Hodge Tyler comes in and oversees the parade, and um, this is uh, him at the, the Phoebus Sentinel building in West Mellon Street. So a, lo a lot of things are changing, a lot of reforms. In the first election in 1901, William H. Trustee, most of you know the trustee house on County Street that's still standing. P.A. Filler built that house as well for, for William H. Trustee on the right there. Uh, North Fleet C. Barnes is um, also, a, uh, these, these men were both elected to the town council in 1901. 
but they are saloon owners, they are business owners, they have property all over the city. Um, some of those buildings are still standing today. Obviously, Trustee's house is there, PA Fuller built that, but Trustee built the, um, where Bender's is today, that building was Trustee's building uh, when it was bought. And there, there is a, you know, a lot of call for reform, a lot of changes. You know, there are a lot of things that are going on, like um, you know, this is the lamp boys um, from the Phoebus Fire Department, so they would be in charge of going around and lighting all the lamps in Phoebus. The, the one that's standing there is Anton Alexander Schmidt, who would become um, Chief Schmidt of the Fire Department and kind of find his life incredible as well. If Tony's listening or Allison, he, you know, he came into this where they've got lamp lighting going on when he was a boy, and when he left, he's trying to, he's building craft for NASA or building models for NASA to put men on the moon. So it's kind of a, quite a lifespan, you know, all the changes that he saw. But the community is, is really um, about renewal at this time. So they're, they're building the sewers and, you know, building up the, the um, uh, sidewalks and, you know, putting in new lights and building the, you know, paving the streets for the first time. And this is putting in rail line. This is looking west up Mellon Street um, this would be down about where Sly Clyde's is now, looking back towards Mallory Street. This is uh, a building that's still there today, but this is um, Mellon and Willard. So they're putting in another uh, trolley line at the time. This is looking, uh, paving Mallory Street for the first time. So looking down from Mellon uh, on Mallory Street, looking down towards the, the food line. And this is the opposite direction, paving Mallory for the first time, looking down towards the old soldier's home. So I know we're running out of time, but um, you know, looking at how the whole march towards prohibition, you know, you go from 80 saloons in 1898 or so to zero in 1916, which is, it's really insane to think about. These were led by William, or the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Virginia Anti-Saloon League. They started passing a whole bunch of new laws limiting rule um, distribution of alcohol, hours limited, uh, Sundays were closing, you know, and, and we go from kind of 24 seven to, you know, really starting to limit the times and days these can be opened, which really changes a lot. And then um, this is the, the headline from the Daily Press, November 1st, 1916. So Virginia goes to prohibition three years before the, the nation does. So it's, it's kind of a strange time. And this is also during World War I as well. And uh, in the article itself, the, the, some of the text says, most of the prominent saloon men yesterday declared they are hopeful of seeing the sale of intoxicants absolutely prohibited. They will use their effort to assist officers in running down speakeasies if they are started in Phoebus. So yeah, well, that's not how it ended, but this is how it ended with a, a lot of speakeasies, a lot of uh, illegal liquor uh, going on, and there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, a town council, a lot of them are saloon owners. There's lax enforcement. You know, this is during World War One. There's a lot worse problems probably in the world to think about. Um, also, we are one stop or so away from Baltimore. So Baltimore's Maryland doesn't come into prohibition for three more years, and they never enforce it. So there's there's alcohol running back and forth between Maryland and Phoebus on a regular basis. And uh, the first month of, of Prohibition, this was the headline in the Daily Press, Phoebus is a model town, first month of Prohibition. So Mayor Joseph E. Dixon, he submits this report to town council that not a single person had been arrested, they hadn't collected any fines, and the, the, the uh, text of the article says, the report rather startled the councilmen who expressed pleasure over the fine showing made for Phoebus during the first month of Prohibition. So I think everybody, you know, a lot of people were in on it, but uh, even looking at this, this is Lancer's Confectionery. This is the, the Richelieu that I showed you before, but it became Lancer's Confectionery selling candy, supposedly. This is uh, 2 East Mellon Street. But if you look at, uh, you know, we talked about this at the, I mean, maybe not the best place to talk about it, but at the church a year and a half ago. If you look at the picture, those guys on the right definitely look like gangsters, and there's a slot machine on the counter, so it's, you know, it's still kind of fuzzy. And if you look at, you know, it looks like P.A. Fuller, his son at this time had taken over Fuller's and you kind of feel bad for him because he's really good at selling alcohol and he has to go into paintings and 
fireworks, and things that don't really work at Fuller's, as you would imagine. And this is a photo from the pool halls. They blacked out the windows and were still obviously selling a lot of alcohol. And although the research is, is really kind of that I put together is, is federal records, it's kind of anecdotal, but this is the, kind of the first time in you know, 1920, two, three, that you start seeing organized crime get, a, get some kind of a foothold in, in the Phoebus area. And this is another shot from about 1928. So there's a couple things I wanted to share before I'm, I'm done with this. Um, you know, one is, is this, um, you know, during prohibition, one of the town council members is arrested by the Department of Justice. He has whiskey all through his house, uh, not a shock. But they, gave, they give Mayor Dixon absolute control of the Phoebus police force, which seems like a good idea. Um, but it turns out he's probably in on this whole um, bootlegging as well, which is not the greatest idea. And there's articles in the press about uh, liquor sellers who the Department of Justice shows up and they already know what's going on. They already know, they've already cleared out their entire inventory and they're laughing at the police that are showing up there. Um, in 1922, these rumors have gotten so bad that the, the um, um, sorry, the, the judge in, in Elizabeth City County um, indicts the Phoebus Mayor Dixon and George Lancer in connection with taking bribes uh, from bootleggers and gamblers. And they go to trial a month later and they're acquitted by a jury of their peers, which are also from the Phoebus area. Um, the next year though, they, um, they are voted out and um, Postmaster William J. Carney wins the race for mayor in a landslide, um, carries the wards, and he would lead Phoebus from 1923 till when he passed away in office in 1941. And alcohol would be uh, illegal till 1933, the end of the year. And you couldn't get a mixed drink, I was told, in, in Virginia till the 1960s. But uh, ABC store, the first day that it was open, the line was around the block and, and was causing quite a commotion in Phoebus. And I'm going to go just two more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. A um, couple more things. Great hurricane of 1933. This wiped out a lot of things in the area, including streetcars. This is a photo of them ripping up the streetcar tracks. Um, during the Great Depression, um, we can talk about this more some other time, but you know, we, we kind of came out of the Great Depression relatively unscathed. Um, and looking at um, Nelson Fuller, he said it was because of the military, seafood, the shipyards, and politics in that order. So a lot of things going on. This is um, looking at Mill Creek. This is L.M. Newcomb who was running the fishing fleets down at Mill Creek in the 1930s, um, the 1920s, 1930s. And he built the, the um, Old Point Bank in 1923. He donated the land and built the church, the um, Phoebus United Methodist Church in 1925. Uh, this is the Bank of Phoebus here as well. Um, post office being built in 1938. This is the fire department and the town hall that were built. Uh, the jail was there at one point, and um, later this became all of, of the um, fire department. Um, I have a few other things to say, but I'm sorry. Running out of time. Uh, consolidation with Hampton in 1952. Um, there, was a, there was a big push for consolidation around the peninsula. Um, 1950. Newport News, Warwick, Phoebus, Hampton, everything tried to, to merge at that time. All the, pretty much the entire peninsula, and um, that failed six to one. But in 1952, Hampton, Elizabeth City County, and Phoebus all uh, launched their own coalition or consolidation efforts, and uh, that passed 562 to 99. So that's when Phoebus became officially part of Hampton. And HRBT, uh, 1957, killed the ferry traffic coming in to, uh, from Old Point Comfort and through Phoebus. Uh, Baltimore Wharf was demolished in 1960. And I'll just leave you with one more thought, and that is um, you know, kind of looking at Phoebus as a series of waves, you know, that there's downturns and there's, there's um, recoveries and all these things. So we look at you know, even the, the um, you know, prohibition going on, there's a recovery and the, the economy comes back. You know, we look at things like the ferry stopping and the downturn in the economy and things rebound and, and kind of accelerate. 
we see Fort Monroe closing in 2011, and we see, you know, it takes time to get back to normal, but it does, and things get much better. And, you know, looking at COVID-19 now and kind of seeing the recovery in that, I definitely see that, that Phoebus has a, a very bright future, and, you know, this is part of a, another pattern. So with that, I would just say, if you have any photos to share, I run a daily blog, Phoebus in Fort Monroe, then and now. We put all these on Phoebus Memories. Uh, please share your photos. I've been doing this for two and a half years and I'm, I'm getting kind of stale at what I'm putting up every day and would really appreciate new content. So with that, I'd say thank you and thank you to Alan and, and to Seamus for having me here today. You have a, uh, a couple of questions and uh, you're welcome to expand uh, your comments out. Uh, I do want to read one comment that, that I think is perfect that just absolutely cracked me up and Marianne you know who you are uh, who said she worked at Fort Monroe uh, from 55 to 62 and her mother didn't like that she had to go to, through Phoebus to get to work so <laughs> I guess Phoebus had a reputation still yeah yeah that, that had a there's a lot of people that have said that on the blog it's <laughs> pretty amazing all right uh, a question from uh, Annie Clemens uh, wonder if there are any haunted houses in Phoebus. So Annie, Annie is a good friend and she's coming for a music festival we put together and she's staying at one of the haunted houses. Ah. So she'll find out soon enough, but uh, I don't know if there's any, the uh, buildings are all, you know, the buildings are from 1880s, 1870s, 1900s, so it's, I'm sure there's some ghosts around there somewhere. All right, and from uh, Renata, uh, Yarborough Sanders, uh, isn't that saloon on Mallory where the seafood crab place is now? Must have been from one of your photos. Um, I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to think of like what the, f um, I don't think so. I think on Mallory Street, I don't think there's anything down, okay. down that way that I could think of. But I'll, I'll look at that again and, and double check the photos and let you know, Renata. Well, that you don't have a photographic memory of, of uh, Phoebus then and now is very disappointing. <laughs> um, okay, from uh, Judith Brandon, where were the Phoebus municipal buildings? So, the, the, um, uh, you know, early days, like they, they had the Bank of Phoebus uh, that was over across from one uh, East Mellon Street. So there, there was the Bank of Phoebus there in the early decades of the 20th century, and that's where the town council met quite a bit. There was another, um, like an, after 1938, they built the, the, where the fire department is now, the building next to that, it's all connected now, but that was the town hall. And that was where the mayor's office was. And that's where they did all the community business. Um, would that would merge in the, I think of the eighties with the fire department. Now that's all fire department building, but the, the jail is actually still in that building. And, and a question from Greg Siegel. Uh, what's the plan and history behind the gazebo you're working on? That's a great question. Um, so we are, um, last August, last July, um, th there was a gazebo on Willard Avenue and we moved that um, down and we started um, sanding it down and, and kind of redoing the woodwork and now it's looking for a permanent home for that. So the the idea is to put it in a public space, um, you know, whether that's the waterfront park, whether that's somewhere else, but a place where once it's restored that people can kind of come and see it and enjoy it and it can be part of the community. So I don't know, it's, it's probably, I think we're probably three months away from having that finished, maybe a little bit more. It's like volunteers when we have the time to, to do all the sanding and it's, it's um, lead-based paint, so it's uh, really meticulous. And I have one from, uh, from me. Uh, you spoke to it just briefly. Uh, when I was doing uh, the research, uh, pulling together our exhibit on the coming of the NACA uh, to Hampton in 1915 and 1916, I, I did discover that, I didn't discover, I, I ran across the information that others had known for a long time, <laughs> that uh, it was very much on the minds of uh, the movers and shakers in, in the area that uh, it was going dry and that was a significant source of income. So I kind of looked at it from the perspective of, you know, NASA and, and yeah. it coming here uh, and how the, the, the movers and shakers lured them here to kind of make up that gap of the economy. What's your take on that from the other side of the perspective, from uh, 
from the folks in Phoebus who might have been losing their uh, their businesses? Yeah, I, that, you know that is never clear. Like I was I was doing a lot of research on that. Like you think the all the income lost. It was I'm trying to think of the exact numbers. I was looking at it a couple nights ago, but just all the lost revenue that they had starting in 1916. You know that that would be traumatic, and they would you know they'd go into something else, and there would only be so many candy stores that they could put up. You know, but I think it's. You know, like some of it, some people obviously they went into bootlegging, but there was, I mean, there were people that actually went into other running restaurants or running other things. So like this kind of entrepreneurial spirit that, that went on. And I think it's the same probably when Fort Monroe to try to make up that lost revenue of all those soldiers coming here for, you know, dry cleaning and restaurants and all that. And, you know, somehow people, they hold on or there's new businesses that come in and kind of take it to, a, to another level. All right, have uh, another one just came in. Uh, what was the building that uh, the Benthal's market originally built used for? What was that building used for? The, the Benthal's market where yes. um, the Hampton is now? I, I, I assume, Oh, yes. okay. Well, yeah, that just came in. <laughs> there, there's the Benthal's that's it's on, on Mellon Street, um, and that, that was the second location of Benthal's um, grocery store, like meat market and grocery store. So it's the Hampton now. Um, where that's located. Uh, the Bentall brothers, they had another place on Howard, um, Howard Street back in the early 1900s and moved, I think about 1913 to that building. So it's, it's been there for quite a long time and it's, it looks beautiful now with um, the Hampton in there and the vent space and I look forward to them actually having weddings and things in there again once COVID's over with. Well, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Let me bring myself in front of the camera for a, a quick uh, greeting with our, uh, our uh, patrons. But uh, So uh, thank you for joining us tonight on the Port Hampton Lecture Series. Remember those things we talked about?